Hello. Pokemon Black and White. Black and White 2. Sun and Moon. How about Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon? Pokemon Platinum? Or might it just be Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee? No. Today, we step away yet again from the mainline core Pokemon games and delve into the spin-offs realm. We'll be journeying through the gripping world of Pokemon Mystery Dungeon, Explorers of Sky. It's well worth noting that the Pokemon Mystery Dungeon series is not produced and developed by Game Freak. The responsibility lies with Chunsoft. They would merge with Spike in 2012, changing their name to Spike Chunsoft. Spike Chunsoft specializes in role-playing, adventure, and visual novel games, with some of their notable releases being the first five Dragon Quest games. They have also released a number of Mystery Dungeon games, not limited to the Pokemon series. And naturally, it's a given that their storytelling style would be very different compared to Game Freak's. In this video, we'll be going through the story of Explorers of Sky, where we'll jump into the world of Pokemon as a former human. Before we do that though, Future Me would like to have a word with you about Surfshark, this channel's first ever sponsor. In the year of our lord 2022, surfing the internet at home unprotected, not good. Have a video blocked in your region, not good. Dipping your feet in public Wi-Fi all willy-nilly, not good. Surfshark VPN, very good. Surfshark VPN keeps you safe and private by encrypting everything you do online. When your device connects to the internet, all the information your device sends are all encrypted and blurred out, rendering online snooping undoable. This is especially useful in public spaces and connections where your information is readily available if you're connecting unprotected. Surfshark also enables you to virtually change your location, enabling you to access content otherwise unavailable. In my case, Pokemon TV is not available in my region because the Pokemon company doesn't know we exist yet, so with Surfshark, I'm able to virtually change locations and access Pokemon TV's library. So in summary, surfing the internet at home unprotected, unprotected no longer. Have a video blocked in your region, blocked no longer. Dipping your feet in public Wi-Fi all willy-nilly, willy-nilly no longer. You now have a Surfshark sock on your feet. Surfshark VPN, wait no longer. Use the link below and enter promo code INDETRO for 83% off and 3 extra months for free. Thank you Surfshark for sponsoring this video. And now, back to the video. In true Pokemon Mystery Dungeon fashion, the game starts off with a quiz. This quiz determines your nature, and ultimately that nature will equate to your starter Pokemon. People that have played this game would probably associate the nostalgia with the starter they got, so for neutrality's sake, I looked up a guide on this quiz to try and get a Pikachu. It took a few tries, but I eventually got it. We also get to choose our partner Pokemon, so I went with a Piplup, the partner I chose as a teenager when I first played this game. I will try my best to refer to the partner Pokemon as the, well, partner Pokemon. In doing so, even if you didn't pick a Piplup in your game, you could hopefully still remember everything that you and your partner went through. The game opens with a scene of distress, with a character seemingly trying to save someone else. It all came to naught in the end, with their consciousness slipping away. Following what had seemed like a vicious storm, we found our player character washed up at the beach. Still weak from our previous ordeal, we slowly drifted off unconscious. Here, we were first introduced to our partner Pokemon and his, well, nature. So our partner Pokemon here wasn't the bravest of sort. He had ambitions of being an explorer, hence his decision to try and join an exploration guild. Our sentimental and reflective partner here would then spend time on his favorite spot at the beach to cheer himself up. We would see this self-conversation a lot as the story unfolds, which I think is an excellent way to really solidify and strengthen the character traits for those involved in the story. Our partner would then discover us on the beach, where the revelation of our past as a human was a bit hard to believe. We would quickly realize that we have lost our memories, only able to recall our name. This encounter was cut short, however, as the two poison-type thugs came and stole our partner's precious treasure. We spared no time and quickly agreed to help our future partner. I won't go into details about the gameplay, as I'm sure many of you still remember how this game goes. But for those of you who have never played this game, this game's combat and gameplay is made up of randomly generated dungeons. We would then traverse these dungeons in a roguelike turn-based manner. 
This game is by no means a walk in the park, as inventory management and team building definitely comes more into play later in the game. This first dungeon was quite short, and the boss is quite easy. We were able to quickly defeat the coughing and Zubat, and our partner's treasure was safely retrieved as well. Our partner thanked us for the help, and further explained his treasure, an object that he referred to as a relic fragment. He asked us what we would do now, and proposed to form an exploration team together. As we were left with no directions and no place to call home, we decided to accept the offer and form an exploration team with our partner. The first step in making an exploration team would be to register with the guild and to undergo formal training. So here we are again, back at Wigglytuff's guild. With us at his side, our partner finally worked up the courage to enter the guild and formally register. Here, we would witness the many side characters of the story, with each of them having a very distinct personality. Chatot, the rather bossy head of intelligence and vice leader of the guild, showed us around the facilities and we met Wigglytuff, the goofy and mysterious leader of the guild. We were then also introduced to the very kind Bidoof, who took the time to show us around Treasure Town. We came across the Meryl and Azuril siblings, and it was here that we were first introduced to our character's ability. Upon touching Azuril's dropped apple, we heard Azuril scream for help in a vision. We shrugged it off, and encountered the pair again shortly, where a drowsy had agreed to help them look for their treasure. Upon the accidental contact with the drowsy, we would witness another vision, this time of said drowsy threatening Azuril. Our partner wouldn't believe that this seemingly nice drowsy would do that, and we returned to the guild. We arrive at the outlaws board right as it was being updated, only to see that drowsy was indeed a wanted criminal, proving our visions right. A quite distressed Meryl told us of what happened, and we pursued Azuril and the Drowsy up Mount Bristle. We defeated the Drowsy, and had him apprehended by Officer Magnezone. Shotot praised us for our work, and took most of our money. At night, our partner pondered upon recent events, and told us that time was stopping in some regions. And it was here that we first got a glance of the game's villain character. As we quickly adjust and settle as an exploration team apprentice, we took on missions at the guild and adapted to our routine. From being woken up rudely by the adorably obnoxious Laudrid, the morning assembly, the occasional gatekeeper duty, having the majority of our prize money swiped by the guild, and having dinner together. The game never fails to show us these. And I think these sequences are crucial parts of the game. Repetition breeds retention. These repeated scenes and actions are one of the cruxes of the game. They are what made us remember being in Wigglytuff's guild, getting through the days as apprentices. These routines are what made us comfortable. You might feel the need to rush through some of these scenes, sure, but we can all take comfort in the fact that they'll always be there. 
that we can always come back to it. One morning, Shatot announced that time had stopped at Tree Shroud Forest due to its time gear being stolen. Shatot pulled us aside and assigned a mission for us to undertake. We were supposed to go investigate a waterfall that may contain a secret. So we went to that waterfall and found nothing. That is, until we decided to touch the waterfall which triggered another vision. This time of a shadowy figure leaping through the waterfall revealing a secret cave behind it. Our partner decided to have faith in us and together we leapt into the crushing waterfall. And surely enough, we were right. We explored the waterfall and reached a dead end. Our partner tried to grab the giant gem to no avail. We were hounded by another vision, this time of the same shadowy figure pressing the gem and getting washed out by a torrent of water. Sure enough, the same thing happened to us. We landed in a hot spring and headed back home, so it wasn't all that bad. Back at the guild, our partner in Shatot was quite excited about the new discovery, but we insisted that Wigglytuff had probably discovered that place first. This was later confirmed by Shatot, meaning so far, our visions had a 100% accuracy. Later that night, Wigglytuff summoned us, informing that the guild would be mounting a full expedition soon, and that we might be chosen for it. For that, we must always try our best and produce good results. The two poison thugs were back, this time with their leader, Skuntank. It turned out that these Pokemon had an exploration team of their own, called Team Skull. Throughout the next few days, Team Skull would repeatedly bother and hinder our progress, while getting on Wigglytuff's good graces at the same time. Their goal was to join the expedition and snatch the treasure for themselves. Since they were also staying in the guild with us, they decided to raid the guild's pantry, causing the guildmaster's favorite perfect apples to be depleted. The next day, Shatot sent us to secure some perfect apples to which we obliged. Once we got to the deepest part of Apple Woods, however, we were set up by Team Skull, who planned this whole thing to make us fail the mission. Shatot was understandably less than pleased and we were sent to bed without dinner. While Team Skull managed to make themselves look better by delivering a perfect apple to Wigglytuff. The next day, we were told that it was unlikely that we would be selected for the expedition, but we did get some food saved for us by Bidoof, Sunflora, and Chimeco. What kind souls. And then came the announcement for the expedition to Fogbound Lake. That's right, everyone gets to go. Because it's more fun with everyone involved. We love you, Wigglytuff. I'll spare you guys the details of the journey to Fogbound Lake, as we eventually made it to the rendezvous point after teaming up with Bidoof. The guild decided to split up once more, trying to find a way into Fogbound Lake. We came across this sunken Groudon statue, where the group reached an impasse. Upon touching the statue, our vision was triggered once more, showing us how to solve this puzzle. There was a short face-off with Team Skull, but the Guildmaster unknowingly saved the moment. We were able to clear the Steam Cave dungeon and were faced with an ominous enemy, Groudon itself. What would happen if we were to battle Groudon, you might ask?
Unfortunately, Groudon decided to take a nap in the midst of battle and got absolutely decimated. The Groudon would then disappear, revealing that it was merely an illusion. An illusion created by Uxie, the true guardian of Fogbound Lake. Uxie believed our claim that we meant no harm and invited us to the lake. Here we first laid eyes on the existence of a time gear. The whole guild made it to the lake and witnessed the scenery, as well as promising Uxie that none present shall speak a word about Fogbound Lake and its treasure. With that promise, the guild returned to Treasure Town, where they would soon encounter a rather renowned, resourceful, and noble explorer. Although Diglett wasn't able to identify his footprints, his name alone was enough to shock the guild with his sudden appearance. Dustnor, an explorer who rose to prominence quickly, seemingly out of nowhere. Famed for his vast knowledge and fighting prowess, it was no surprise that the members of the guild was incredibly excited about his visit. Dustnor had apparently come to the guild to ask about Fogbound League and his treasure, to which Wigglytuff rightly kept a secret. Chowtot reminded the guild not to embarrass him, but Dustnor was more than willing to help the guild. Then, not long after, another time gear was stolen. Uxie initially suspected that it was the guild, but the perpetrator denied having heard of Fogbound Lake from anyone. The next morning, Marilyn and Azura approached us with a request, saying their precious item had been taken ransom and placed in Amp Plains. With no second thought, we accepted the request and headed to Amp Plains. When we finally reached the top of Amp Plains, it seemed as though we had been set up yet again. Despite our best efforts in repelling the Manectric and his gang, it wasn't enough. The Manectric was going to unleash his rage. That was until Dustnor came along and saved us. He had heard about the situation from the Marilyn and Azula brothers and came to our rescue. With the situation resolved, we were able to collect the precious item and deliver it to the brothers. Upon returning, the Kecleon brothers complimented our team's ability to pinpoint events with such accuracy, and our partner here revealed the fact that we were able to see visions of the past and future. Dustnor seemed to know about this ability, coining it the Dimensional Scream. With Dustnor apparently having a degree of knowledge about this ability, we decided to consult him about our human past. Bidu then called us with an emergency at the guild. The news of the stolen time gear finally made its way to the guild, as well as the culprit, Grovile. We had to explain the reason we lied to Dusnor, and the guild's focus shifted to finding Grovile. Dusnor naturally also offered his assistance. Our team was sent to investigate the northern desert, but unfortunately, we had to come back empty-handed. However, the guild kept its spirit and vowed to try again the next day. Trusting our intuition, our partner believed us and we went back to the desert, discovering another dungeon beneath the quicksands. At the end of Quicksand Cave, we arrived at the underground lake, witnessing an all too familiar green light emanating from the lake. Mistaken as a thief who stole the other time gears, we had to battle the lake's guardian, Mesprit. We won the battle, 
and was able to attempt to explain what our intention was before Groval came along and knocked everyone out to steal the time gear. As time started to stop at the lake, we escaped the underground lake in haste. With Mesprit in protective custody with Officer Magnazone, the guild was able to determine their next course of action with our dimensional scream ability. The next time gear location was most probably at Crystal Cave, where we saw Groval attacking Azelf. Getting to Crystal Lake wasn't easy, but we eventually made it to the heart of the cave, almost one step too late. Azelf had been beaten, but the Lake Guardian was able to block the path to the time gear with the last of his powers. We faced Groval in battle, where we were able to stall for time. Groval proved to be too powerful for us and came so close to finishing our partner when Dustnor showed up just in time. He had saved our partner and came to confront Groval, seemingly having their own history. However, even the great Dustnor has his limits as Groval was able to slip past him, escaping our grasps. When we came to at our best in the guild, Diglett informed us of the meeting that Dustin was going to hold in Treasure Town, where he would inform everyone of what was really happening. Officer Magnazone opened the meeting, telling everyone that Groval failed to steal Crystal Lake's time gear. Then, Dustnor revealed that he had indeed been chasing Groval for a time now, and the fact that Groval came from the future, a wanted criminal with a bounty on his head. To escape Dustnor, Groval decided to flee to the past, where he plotted to steal the time gears to cause the planet's paralysis. All that was present in the meeting unanimously agreed to stop Groval and hatched a plan to capture him. A few days later, Deputy Magnemite informed the guild that Groval had been captured. Dustnor's plan had gone without a hitch and he opened a dimensional hole where he would take Groval back to the future. Through Deputy Magnemite, Dustnor expressed that he wished to say goodbye before going back. At the town square, everyone witnessed Groval being escorted back to the dimensional hole and Dustnor left a message with the Lake Trio with a task, putting the time gears back in their rightful places. The great Dustnor then bid his final farewell bringing the Time Gear Saga into its timely end. It seems like this wasn't the end after all. Dustnor betrayed us. No, he was never on our side to begin with. He played us for fools. We woke up in a jail with our partner and there was no way out. The Sableye henchman came in and blindfolded us before dragging us to an execution site. It was us, our partner, and Groval. Our only chance to fight back was during the execution itself when the Sableye started to frantically use fury swipes. With the slightest of chances when the ropes broke, we attacked and used a diversion to escape, or made it seem like we escaped.
Before long, we ran out and made our way out. During a brief rest, Groval explained our circumstances. We were in the future where a temporal tower had collapsed and the planet had gone into paralysis. The very same one Dusnor had explained to the residents of Treasure Town. Our partner had trouble believing Groval, and Groval decided it was better to move separately if there was no trust between the three of us. Things looked bleak. And to top it off, we couldn't use our dimensional scream. Our partner still couldn't believe Dustnor's betrayal. The only thing to do at this point was to ask Groval. We reached the end of the sealed ruin and bested a spirit tomb who was holding Groval captive. Groval had been taken by surprise and was sealed, and we freed him. We decided to hear out Groval first and move on. Groval explained that the stopping of time was caused by the collapse of Temporal Tower, where Dialga, the legendary Pokemon that controlled time, resided. Time gradually got out of control and Dialga's mind along with it. Dialga, now regressed into its primal state, devoid of any reason, was only interested in preserving its own existence. That was the reason why Groval was targeted. Had Groval been successful in restoring time, he would have altered the course of history and primal Dialga wouldn't have come into existence. Our partner, still undecided, tried to see Dusnor. He was promptly stopped by Groval, who reminded him that he needed to decide for himself. Along with Groval, there was only one place left to go in this bleak future, the Dusk Forest. This was the home of Celebi, who helped Groval travel to the past for the first time. Midway through the forest, we were joined by said Celebi, who informed us that to travel in time again, we needed to go to the Passage of Time. For that, we went deeper into the forest. Upon arriving at the Passage of Time, we were unaware that we had been set up by Dusnoir and Primal Dialga himself. Grova lost hope at the sight of Primal Dialga and quickly surrendered.
we made it back. Celebi stopped Dustnor's advance, enabling us to go back to the present. Or was it the past? Due to Groval's outlaw status, we decided to rest over at Sharpedo Bluff, our partner's former home, prior to joining the guild. Groval was glad that we were alive and shared what he knew about the dimensional scream. Our partner, unable to sleep, was joined by Groval, who was curious what drove him to keep fighting in a seemingly hopeless situation. We went back to Tree Shroud Forest only to find that even though the time gear was restored, time still wasn't flowing. Temporal Tower had started its collapse. Groval collected the time gear, and we were at a loss on what to do. It was one thing collecting all of the time gear, but where could Temporal Tower possibly be? The only lead we had was that a place called the Hidden Lands supposedly holds the key to the Temporal Tower. With Groval off to secure the remaining time gears, we only had one place to go. Back to Wigglytuff's Guild. We worked up the courage to go back, and everyone couldn't be happier to welcome us back. We decided to tell the story of what happened, but no one would believe us. We can believe Shatot, right? With everyone's help and the wisdom from Torkoal, the town elder, we eventually had a lead that pointed us in the direction of Brian Cave, a place where Wigglytuff and Shatot had seen the inscription on our partner's relic fragment before. Upon deciding to check for Groval, we found that he left a note at Sharpedo Bluff base telling us that he was doing well in his part with the Time Gears. We headed to the beach where our partner reminisced about how we met and saw this Lapras swimming across the ocean. Team Skull also made a brief return here. The whole guild made the expedition to Brine Cave, where a little snippet of Wigglytuff's and Shatos Pass were revealed. Upon beating the dungeon boss, we arrived at the wall that Wigglytuff had encountered in the past. Our partner's relic fragment activated the pattern, causing it to shoot a beam of light. Lapras appeared and revealed that the beam of light was a signal of entry to the hidden land. We rode on Lapras's back, all the while listening to the story of how Wigglytuff met Lapras and how Shatot heroically saved Wigglytuff all those years ago. Before long, we would finally reach the Hidden Land. Lapras told us that to reach Temporal Tower, we had to reach a mystical vessel called the Rainbow Stone Ship. We braved and challenged the Hidden Land with Groval, finally reaching the Rainbow Stone Ship. All we had to do was place the Relic Fragment on the Stone Ship itself. But life could never be that easy, could it? Dust Noir was waiting. He knew that we had to go to the Rainbow Stone Ship to reach Temporal Tower, so he lied in wait. We fought Dust Noir and his crew of Sableye. We won the battle, but Dustnoir proved to be too tough. 
Dustnor revealed the mouth on his stomach once more, preparing a final ultimate attack. But we didn't give up. We couldn't give up. With Dusnar rendered unable to fight, all the Sableye lackeys escaped. Our partner then went to activate the stone ship while we kept watch on Dusnar with Grova. It's true. If we succeed in our mission, we'll disappear. Celebi and Gruval had the resolve to die when they undertook this mission. And we did too. Our partner was able to activate the stone ship, but that didn't stop Dustmore from trying to finish his objective. We couldn't give up, even if it meant losing our lives in the process. With the Rainbow Stone Ship activated, we rode the vessel upwards towards Temporal Tower where the final dungeon is located. After a tough climb up, we finally reached the Temporal Pinnacle where Dialga was located. We found where the time gears were supposed to be placed, but Dialga stopped us from doing so, mistakenly identifying us as trespassers who sought the destruction of Temporal Tower. It seemed like with the collapse of Temporal Tower, Dialga was starting to lose its ability to reason, forcing us into a battle. We were able to somehow win this long battle and quickly place the time gears into the slots. Upon waking, it seemed that we had successfully stopped the collapse of Temporal Tower, signified by Dialga regaining its ability to think and reason. With its telepathy, it showed that time was flowing again and the world regaining its normalcy. Dialga thanked us, and with that, we had saved the world. But what happened after, I'll let you see for yourself.
That was raw. That moment when the realization of reality dawns upon you, when you can't contain your feelings anymore, what our partner went through, was a feeling we all know too well. This game took me on an emotional roller coaster I've never felt before from a Pokemon game back in 2009, and it completely caught me by surprise. I don't think I did this game justice with this video. There's a lot more depth and layers to this game, more than I could possibly pack in one video. I highly recommend that you play it for yourself, this video doesn't even extend to the post-game story. That's right, there's more story to be unraveled in the post-game, and they're all equally important to how the plot ties it all up. And it's definitely no less enthralling than the main story. But for now, as this video ends, I'll leave you with this post credit scene. I hope this video has been enjoyable, and as always, please take care.